Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to this Commonwealth Club presentation. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Reilly. I'm chair of the psychology forum at the Commonwealth Club, and I will be the moderator for today's meeting. I am pleased to introduce, introduce today's speaker, Ms. Susan Gerbic. Affectionately called the Wikipediatrician, Susan is the founder of Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia and founder of Monterey County Skeptics. Ms. Gerbic was the winner of the James Randi Foundation Award in 2017. In 2018, she founded and manages About Time, a nonprofit organization focused on scientific skepticism and activism. While her particular focus has been on grief vampires, in other words, psychics, her activism encourages all areas of skepticism. You can find out more about it at About Time's project, one word, abouttimeproject.org. And incidentally, if you have any questions for Ms. Gerbic, Please use the text chat feature, and as time allows, uh, I will have her respond to your questions. So without further ado, please welcome Ms. Gerbic. Thank you so much, Patrick. I have been a longtime fan of the uh, Commonwealth Club. I actually have attended some of the lectures back in the day before, before the pandemic, <laughs> in the before times. And um, of course, I consume and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And the talk I'm going to give you guys today is a bit different, I think, from what you're used to, because this this is a topic I haven't seen in ever really anybody do on um, your channel. So I hope I hope I will be able to condense it in a way that's understandable. Everything I'm going to be speaking about today is general and condensed, but they but I have everything in. Uh, articles that they can actually look at. Some of them have, there's even some audio in some places as well, but it's all condensed in our website. And I'll give you the link at the very end of the presentation. So Operation Onion Ring. I'm going to define a few terms just before we get started so that everybody is on the same page. I'm going to use the term psychic, medium, and grief vampire all interchangeably. A psychic and a medium can be different things, but for the sake of this presentation, a medium is someone who claims to be able to communicate with dead people. And a grief vampire is someone who we have, um, my boyfriend, Mark Edward, has used to, um, to, to talk about a person who, like a psychic detective or someone who's trying to get their, their hooks into someone who's grieving, vulnerable, um, despondent, um, for whatever reason, and there's many reasons that a person in their life would be wanting to go through um, seeking out a psychic and maybe contact the dead, but we call them grief vampires. I'm trying to get that word popularized, so we'd be happy to have you <laughs> send it out into the world even more. A sitter is a person who is sitting for a reading. Now, of course, they could be standing, of course, but that's just a general term that's been used um, even you know, beyond Harry Houdini's time of, of somebody who is getting a reading from a, a psychic or a medium. And cold reading is the most typical, um, it's the most common way for a psychic to look like they're working. And that is um, where you make general statements about somebody that look like they're, they're uh, detailed, but actually when you get down to it, it's not as as uh, specific as it would seem, because humans really are more alike than they are different. And there's a lot of commonalities with people. So for example, some, a, a psychic could say, you know, I feel like inside you've been wanting to write a book that you have a story in you that you would like to tell. Now that's pretty general when you really think about it, because the story that they would like to tell could be their own personal story or about somebody else they know, or a story about a fantasy, creature they've uh, written there's a lot of a lot of vagueness about that statement but to a person who is really thinking about writing a story or just likes the idea of being able to write a story that seems very specific and so they will take that that statement and they will call it a hit um, cold reading 
can be just the way you look, the way you, the impression you make on the person, the objects in the background of the person that you're looking at, the way they smell, the way they walk, the, the jewelry they're wearing. Those are all different aspects of cold reading. And so this is the most typical type of psychic reading. It's, it's a lot of wordplay as well. So um, if you break it down into what they actually say, it may not be as specific as you think. And I have lots of examples of cold reading on my website. But hot reading is something that we really haven't discussed as much. It's not, it's not as common because it takes a little more work. And both of these, hot reading and cold reading, is actually a skill. And, and psychics have do this if they're making money. And, you know, there's levels of how good you are at it is any skill. But uh, a hot reader is somebody who's learning something about you beforehand, before you're becoming a sitter. So, for example, they could look at your social media or maybe your um, the psychic was recommended to you. So maybe a person who loves their psychic would say, you have to talk to my sister. She's I know she's being cheated on by her husband. And, you know, it's just so much drama in the household. And if only he saw that it was a co, you know, it's a co-worker, we think. And, and the the person gives a lot of information to the psychic. And so when the sister finally does have a reading with the psychic, they've got a whole lot of information on you already. So it's it's not hard. Plus, if they know that the sister's coming to you, then a lot of things that applied to the first person, the person they had normally seen, like grandparents and other family matters, are going to be relative and, and applicable to the second person they see the sister so these are all different kinds of hot reading there's numerous ways of hot reading but this is more of my special speciality is is the hot reading so i've done many many stings i've done these with um, a group of volunteers that are called the gorilla skeptics we have a private facebook group where we usually talk about these things and um and work them through but over the years i think i started in 2013 with operation bumblebee and that's the only one we've created that wasn't a food and two words so we've got operation pizza roll operation lemon meringue that's what we did during zoom this uh, pandemic operation ice cream cone operation tater tot operation peach pit and then operation bumblebee and these are all as i said on my website if you're interested Today, I'm going to talk about Operation Onion Ring, and I really don't have the time to get into the background of, of any of the other stings or too much detail on Operation Onion Ring, which is why there's an article for you to read. So this is our target. This is Thomas John. He is a grief vampire, and I've proved over and over and over that he is hot reading his, his uh, sitters, and um, we, we know um, that he is hot reading for a lot of reasons. And I'm gonna show you one example here in a minute. But Thomas John is uh, claims to be a psychic medium communicating with the dead. He is uh, someone who had a TV show called Seatbelt Psychic before I even knew who he was and before we targeted him in this thing called Operation uh, Pizza Roll. Uh, Thomas John had a TV show where it was on a network. It only lasted one season. And basically what it was is people would get in the back seat of the car and he would drive them around in a giant loop for an hour and he would read them and he would tell them very specific things. And they would cry and, um, you know, and all the emotions, obviously, that are there with a the hot reading and, and somebody who thinks that they've been uh, read by a psychic medium. The people in the back seat didn't necessarily know that they were going to um, be given a reading. Um, I talked to one person who was in the back seat of the car. He was in tears immediately and didn't realize that they were going in a giant loop, which we figured out by looking at the the pausing the video and looking at the screens behind the um, the driver and the sitter in the in the video of the show, so we could see that we know exactly what the route was, and they were going in just this giant route. Um, and uh, we know um, that. The, like I said, the person I talked to had no idea what was going on. He thought he was going to a game show. He thought he was being picked up to go to some kind of game show and, and that he got in the car and this happened. He had filled out paperwork ahead of time. They knew exactly who he was. And when he was dropped off, there were other people waiting to have their, their route uh, to go on their little thing. But um, it looks on the show like it's a, 
Uber rider or a Lyft ride of some kind, some ride share thing. Yet he never asks people their destination. He never puts any information into the, into the, you know, the, at the dash or anything of the sort. He never confirms who they are, nothing of the sort. So when you watch the show with a skeptical eye, you can see what it is. And I've written about it extensively. My, my team have been amazing about going through and finding the details of these things. It's all possible. So Thomas John had another show, which was called the Thomas John Experience that came out after our New York Times article. And it's basically seatbelt psychic. Um, but sometimes he gets out of the car and he talks to people like in a uh, ice skating rink or something. Again, people he knows already some information on. And then after that, he had a uh, run at in Vegas at Caesars. And he had a show there for oh, maybe five or six months. He predicted that he would be there for a very long time. He had um, was telling people, and I've got screenshots of all of this, about how he's going to be around and, uh, you know, tickets sold and stuff in June, July, August, and going forward. He did not predict that he would not be having any of that happen because there's a pandemic. He didn't predict that at all. No psychic, by the way, did that. And I have another article showing screenshots of all the popular psychics all over the world what their websites looked like before the pandemic and how they were planning events and and so on all through the pandemic which had to be canceled um, some of them including Teresa Caputo had rescheduled her events only to have to uh, cancel it again so they, they don't even know when the pandemic's gonna be over any more than we do so uh, this was um, an article that you might find really interesting it's appeared in the New York Times magazine it is about Thomas John and also another psychic called Matt Frazier. And this was kind of a, you know, a call out moment for us where we were able to put all our information to outside the choir so that they could get information on it. And that's also on our website. So now we're going forward to the pandemic time. Now, I grayed out all these people's faces and all the contact information that's on the Zoom call. As you know, our names are right there on the Zoom screen. So psychics have not been able to do their normal thing where they go out in audiences and have in-person things. So what they're doing is they're, they've moved to Zoom. Now, this has been very lucrative for them. So um, we've attended a lot of the different Zoom readings for Thomas John and others throughout the pandemic. And there could be 300 or more people on these calls. Some of them um, are people who've been read often. And we, can, we know that because they'll say, you know, the last time I talked to you, you got this. So these are what we consider hot readings because once you've been read and you've got information, you just write it down. And the next time you see that name appearing, you could just give them the same information and maybe a little bit more. And it it's, it's, uh, looks like a hit to anybody else who's in the audience. So the price of these things range from, you know, maybe 10 to $25 on up. And there's 300 people in a room. That's a lot of cash. So only maybe 10 people will get a reading out of 300. So they get to pick who they're going to read. Now, when they pick who they're going to read, they pick people who they've either read before or people who they've got their Facebook profile in front of them or, you know, somebody who's maybe a plant. I, we, we've seen all different kinds of things happen. So we did a lot of investigation on various uh, psychics um, and we called it Operation Lemon Meringue. That's also on my website. And um, so what happened is uh, just before Christmas, Thomas John decided he was going to do a spirit uh, circle for children. Now, this is ages five to 12 years old. And his, this is the first time he's attempted to do something like this. He was charging $400 a person. It's, well, $400 for um, a child. And then the parent had to be there as well. It's two hours. And it ended up being a little over two hours. The readings they receive are only going to be about 10 minutes, but I don't think he was clear about that. He said that everybody would get a reading. And I felt, and everybody I talked to said that they thought that this was kind of wrong to do something like this. This was, this was just beyond the pale, over the line, and somebody should do something about it. So it was going to happen in April of 2021. So just not so long ago, it hasn't been quite a year. But he announced it in about, I think it was November of 2020. And he said that he was doing it because people keep asking him to do readings for, for their child. So he was, um, 
I wanted to get this canceled. Um, I just felt it was wrong. But I mean, I don't have any power to do that. If a, if a psychic is going to be performing at a place, at a venue, well, then you have options. You could try to get it shut down by um, talking to the person who rented the room. You could talk to local media to try to get some kind of pushback on the event. Um, same with the anti-vaxxer community. It, if, if they're doing it online, it's really hard to do anything about it. But if they're, if they're in a venue, well, then, you know, it's a different animal. So he was doing it on Zoom. Um, we could find no way of getting this canceled. So we did talk to um, Dr. Stephen Novella, who's a neurologist at Yale, who also runs the very popular uh, skeptic podcast, um, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And he wrote an article for his science-based medicine um, website and his blog. And he said, basically, that it's probably not a good idea to, to be giving readings to children as young as five years old, whose minds are not quite as developed as they should be, and talking to them about mediumship, ghosts, um, shadow people, and, and dead people, that this probably isn't a good idea and he should probably cancel his event. So that's where he put that out. And um, we hoped that it would be shaming enough because I mean, at this point, what else are you gonna do? Um, to have him cancel. And we put this everywhere we could possibly get on social media. And he has, Stephen Novella has a wide range as well. So we just kind of held our breath and hoped that Thomas John would just say, ooh, I've got a yell neurologist that's after me. I probably should not do this, this event for eight children uh, for $400 a pop. So this is Thomas John. It's just a, it's a kind of a grainy video. It's only about 10 seconds long. And this is what he said after he read the Stephen Novella article. Question. Um, we had a couple people, why are we doing something for children? Um, you know, this is what I have to deal with, the crazies in the world. So, you know, somebody said, why are you doing something for children? You take advantage of children. No, we're not taking advantage of children. We are having an event for children. Children are spiritual too. Okay, so what I did is um, that didn't cancel the event. I thought for sure it was like my last hope. So at this point, I figured I'm going to have to attend the event. Now, in January, he said that the event is almost sold out. So here it is four days, five days before the event in April. And I'm thinking, well, I could try to get a ticket. I, I, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to need a child to attend with a parent. It's two hour reading during the week, who's going to want to do that? So I reached out to um, my friend Cherie, who's here on the right hand side, they live in New Zealand. And that's her daughter Lilith on the left and Lilith is 14. And uh, Cherie talked to her daughter Lilith and explained what was going on and asked if she would be okay with doing it. And Lilith was very sweet. And she says, I really don't like the idea of having to lie to children. But I mean, I can see the point. And, and let's, let's do this mom. So they agreed that they would be my um, sitter from New, New Zealand. And um, <laughs> so now this is supposed to be sold out, right? So what I did is I have my sitter, I have my parent. They said they would go on this day for two hours. I mean, that's amazing just to get the volunteer to do that. She's from the New Zealand Skeptics, wonderful organization. I've, I've met her many times. So to get a ticket, I can't use my visa card. Um, if you were to read the article from the New York Times or some of my other articles about Thomas John, he does look at the visa card um, information, who it's registered to. And I have evidence of that as well. And it's all on my website. So I had to actually go get cash, $400, and then go down to my CVS and purchase a visa card and then come back and, and purchase the ticket. And it went through. We got a ticket. So I had to come up with this $400 for this event four days out before the event. I also had to create a name for the person who's going to attend. It can't be Googleable, So I chose Joe Martin, which could be, I guess, male or female um, and ambiguous. I had to come up with an address, that, an actual address that existed in New Zealand and a phone number. And I had her purchase it. You can see the last four digits down there of the visa card. And that's important that if you're attending an event and you have multiple people attending an event, like what we did with Operation uh, Lemon Meringue, everybody has to use a different visa card because it'll look really suspicious if there's five 
tickets purchased and they're all with the same last four digits of a number. There's a lot of work that goes into these things. Let me tell you, trial and error, we've made a lot of mistakes and, I, and I've sure, sure learned. But anyway, this is, our, this is our sitter we have. We're ready to go. So now I have to plant some information. I hope this isn't getting too confusing because, oh my gosh, there's uh, a lot I'm leaving out and trying to just keep it to the basics, you guys. So I have my ticket. We're going to be able to go. Now I have to double blind this, which is how we do our stings. We do not want the psychic to be able to say later that they read the person's mind and the person who attended had information and knew what information was there. So they're just reading their minds. This is a mistake a lot of skeptics do when they try to do a sting. So you have to double blind it. So what I did is I had a long conversation with, with um, Cherie and I asked her, I said, Cherie, if this man is able to communicate with the dead, what would you expect him to find? And what are the names of the people that he would he would find? And so I created a backstory that had nothing to do with her own family, with names that had nothing to do with her own family. And I wrote him an email. And as you can see, it's I ran it by somebody who's from New, uh, New Zealand. So it would sound like something from somebody from New Zealand, just to be very careful. And so... I, the story I created, now I sent him this one email, and I think we exchanged maybe one or two more emails just kind of um, over time, but it wasn't really where I gave much more information. The idea is I'm trying to funnel all the information he can gather on the person who's going to be attending. Remember, he's promised everybody to get a reading to this one email I sent. So the email is on my website in the article I wrote, if you want to read it. It's, it's basically saying that um, and I've changed the names of the of the New Zealand team. They're now Ida and Joe Martin. Totally ungoogleable names, right? So I've told him that um, Ida has been doing really bad in school these days because her grandparents were really sick. Uh, her grandmother was really sick, and they live in London. And they couldn't get to London because of the pandemic. So so nobody could visit each other, and she was just sick. Uh, um, um, Ida was sick of the idea that she couldn't see her grandmother and her grandmother died and I named the grandmother and so they were worried about um, the grandfather still being left there that there was family dynamics that were complicating things and so on and I said that um, there was a lot of issue with with um, the child doing badly in school and and so on and she needed some peace and some um, you know some some of some uh, uh, the psychic to to help her out and we said that she watched all the psychic um seatbelt psychic shows and she was just a big fan and she's actually really quiet and all this kind of stuff so that's what we said that's what i said in the email using uh the best new zealand uh spellings and language i possibly could and as i said i had it checked out with somebody so we got a ticket now what because I can't have the New Zealand team read those emails. Remember, I'm double blinding this. So how are they going to have a reading, a sitting with Thomas John and not know how to answer the statements he makes to them? So if he said a name, I need to be able to say to, to, say to them, that's your brother, that's your sister, or um, I have no idea who that is, you know, something like that. So what we did, um, <laughs> this gets really wild here. Um, so what we did is um, I had a Facebook Messenger group, and I love Facebook Messenger. And I just put about three people on it for my team, including myself and the New Zealand team. And as we're having, as he's going to give him the reading, we're able to tell her what to say after he's already made the statement. So if he says, uh, who is Steve, we'll be able to say, that's your brother. Or, or whatever. And so throughout their 10 minute session with him, you'll, well, you won't see it because I don't, I can't show the video right here, but uh, they glance down at the screen with the messenger and then like maybe they'll wipe their eyes with a little tissue and look at each other and look just kind of sad. And then they'll come back and they'll respond to whatever it is he said. So they're kind of milking it long enough to be able to get the information into their heads. So now how else are we going to watch this? So it's imperative that we are watching it live because we have to give them information. So how do you do that? 
So I don't know about you guys, but um, maybe some people, I can't see the screen. I have no idea if there's five of you out there watching this or 500 people watching this right now, but I bet you there's a good chance that somebody out there is watching this on two screens, right? So we have a, a lot of people who, um, I mean, we didn't have any heads up on this that we were going to need to have these high, high internet, you know, and all these great, you know, desktops and, and microphones and cameras and everything. So what happened is a lot of people will find that they have to use two devices to get into an event. For example, they need their um, phone to handle the audio, but they use their iPad to handle the video something like that. So they'll take the, the link to Zoom and they'll use it twice. So they'll, they'll Zoom with one link to their, you know, PC or their lab um, tablet or iPhone or whatever. And the other is something else. So that's what we did. So um, here is the New Zealand team. This is what their screen looked like throughout the event. And she came into the Zoom screen as Ida Galaxy J6 Plus, right? And since we're communicating with each other over Facebook Messenger, moments after she is in the room, I enter with my decoy that is uh, Pat's iPhone, and I have my video and I have my audio turned off. So in the same way you guys are watching this right now, many of you with your screen off and many of you with your audio off, I can see that much that you guys are all blacked out over there. Just because your audio and your video is off does not mean you can't see me. So you can hear me, you can see me, but I can't see you and I can't hear you. And that's what's going on in this situation. So that's how we got in to be able to see the event is I can see it in real time. Now, that's wonderful. I can see it. Now, how am I going to get this to my team that is watching this on a uh, needs to watch this as well? So what I did, and this is a little dark, I didn't realize I was going to need this screen, uh, a, a picture of this actually for a presentation. So if you see, this is the screen I'm sitting, this is my, the side, that's, that's where the camera is taking the picture of me right now. You can see on the far right hand side of this photo, a very, a, a big camera on a tripod that's pointed at the screen. So typically Thomas John, when they do these readings and a lot of other mediums, is that after you've paid your your money the next day they will send you a recording of the zoom meeting but there's no names on it or anything like that it's just the screen so what i was doing and it's always just the main screen so like if there's people on other screens because you got 300 people on the, the that doesn't show it only shows the screen that the psychic's on so i wanted to make sure there was no issue whatsoever so i put a camera up on a tripod so i know for sure i had the video the other thing that you may or may not be able to see really good, but I have a tripod right in front of me with my with my uh, cord because we do not want to run out of power. I have a tripod with my phone pointed right at the screen like I do at this moment. And now what I'm able to do is I'm able to broadcast what I'm seeing, which is the event uh, live over to Facebook live. And I put it into the private room where only my gorilla skeptics are in. So now not only can I see this live but my team can watch it live on facebook and it's a very closed group so nobody's able to see it but the people who are who are on the team that can be trusted to you know to keep it closed so what they're able to do what that does is that not only does it allow um people to be able to watch and here is a picture of my my boyfriend mark edward who is um an expert on psychics by the way his book psychic blues um is available if you want to read that but he's an expert on psychics and here he is in our living room sitting watching the event unfold for two plus hours on his laptop so he's just watching the facebook live feed that i broadcast this to um and this is how we're able to watch it so this is a picture of, of the event now everybody's grayed out you can't read any of their names for privacy reasons these are children we don't want to have any issue with that at all what um one of the things that did happen during the event was that thomas john well you can see there's there's thomas john and eight other people right so there should only be nine people on the call but there was a tenth and that was me the decoy so at one point at the very beginning of this, he told everybody, he says, yeah, there's 10 people here, but there's really only nine. So don't worry about that other account. Just 
don't worry about it. And so it was his way of saying that he he knew there were, he knew there was another account there, but he didn't know it was me and the girl of skeptics and Mark Edward. So that's on him. So this is what it looks like. It is all women. Um, I don't understand the phenomenon of why women are more likely to show up to the events and to believe in being able to communicate with the dead. I don't know. This is something for somebody's PhD dissertation somewhere someday. I'd like to know the answer too, probably, but this is just the way it is. So these are children. Uh, there's two six-year-olds. I think there's two seven-year-olds and the rest I think are 12. Um, there's no five-year-olds here. Not that that really means a lot, but um, there's some six-year-olds there. One of the children was so young when their father died from what we could find. I can't even believe that the child would know their father. So, you know, I think the child might have been two when the father died. So, you know, for the child to have memories of their parent, you know. Um, so first thing they do is an induction, which is where they, they uh, Thomas John tells them to put, you know, close your eyes and think about who you want to contact. This is a stalling tactic, as well as trying to put people in the mood for it. He's got two hours to fill and he's got 10 minutes per person he gives a reading for. Almost everything else is fill and to listen to it. And I have a transcript also. It's it's intolerable to listen to and to read the transcript. I've gone through it multiple times and it's it's not pleasant to listen to. And the, the person at the very bottom of the screen that you'll see in the middle, that's a little boy. And um, Thomas John called him a little girl. And because uh, <laughs> he has kind of a name that could be, you know, doesn't really have a strong gender. But what I want to point out is above this child, is a giant poster and this child's up and down moving around the whole time there's this giant poster of uh dedicated to his mother who has died the grandmother is the one who has custody and you can see throughout that whole picture of, of the poster not only names of his mother in the middle but also photographs around the outside and just like you would look at anything you could see around me you know you can make judgments about what kind of person i am what kind of life i lead just by looking at a person like a cold reading. So I should point that out. Um, I've changed all the names of all the children, as I said on my on report, but it was quite emotional. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about what they said, but it was cold reading 101. I mean, if you were to read a book on how to cold read, like um, I see coins and they're like, oh, yes, we see coins. Yeah, I find coins all the time. They're like, well, that's your grandmother trying to send you messages. It's it's really bad. The children were emotional, lots of tears. Um, the parents, it's obvious that the parents badly wanted, wanted the reading themselves. And this was a, a way of drawing their child in. Many times the, the parent wanted the child to feel like they were a part of the event and to remember the dead family members that they have no memory of or probably don't really care too much about, rarely think of, but the mother did. And so, in some of the cases, um, like in this young woman, I just wanted to reach out and hug her so bad. She was, um, uh, and this happened in several cases, the children appeared to be mediums themselves at one point in their lives. And now it's fading. They're not seeing uh, the dead as much anymore. They're not appearing in their dreams as much anymore. They're not as special. And that I use that word because that's kind of how it felt is that these children badly wanted to please their mothers and to um, have this talent, but it's fading. And so that was part of the reason I feel that they went to this event is to try to help them out to get that specialness back. And um, it, it was very sad, very, very, very sad. And I just think it was child abuse. It was cruel and just wrong. The children are growing on with their lives. They're moving along with their lives. They're, they're not thinking about it like they did before but it's so important to their mothers that they do and it just was really really sad so um th at this point you can see this is another screenshot of people that have got them all kind of down you can see another picture of the little boy in the far right corner with the photographs behind him you know he was moving around a lot so the screenshot changed of what was behind him so you could see a little bit more or a little less um, I'm not going to go into detail about the the readings. As I said, I have it all broken down. Um, what he actually said to them, uh, changing some 
summing it up more or less and changing like if it said that um, their dad's name is Frank, I might have used some other name so that the children wouldn't be able to be identified. But when these children do grow up, they'll be able to, if they want to, they'll be able to find my article and it'll explain what actually happened to them. So, um, but in the articles, I have all that. So here is on the left-hand corner, um, left-hand corner in the bottom, there's a couple down there. It's a mother and a daughter and their name is Julie Jones and Jasmine Jones. And they got a very specific reading as, as well, you know, uh, on top. Oh, I should mention that our, our team got a very specific reading. It went on and on about um, that she had a grandparent, a grandmother in who wants to be in touch with her. The grandmother wanted to reach out. Um, the grandmother's concerned about her grades. The grandmother lives in another country. Maybe it's England and so on basically saying what it is that i said in that reading so in the email i sent him so he's got 10 minutes to spend with them he gave everything in about a minute to them so the rest of the time it's just gobbledygook where he's going back and forth is this your mother is this your maternal mother that means your mom's mother or is this your your father's mother is this and you're sure it's your mother's mother, right? And she was, and she was, she was her grandmother, right? And she died at Christmas time, right? She she died recently, and Ida got a little confused. I don't blame her because there's a lot of back and forth. And she said, "It well, it wasn't that. It was a long time ago." And he says, "Well, wasn't it Christmas time?" And she goes, she looks down at what we wrote in the chat, and we said yes. And she says, "Yeah." And he goes, "Well, it's only April, so that was just a few months ago." And she's like, "Oh yeah, yeah." You know, so he's like, he has all the information she doesn't have. So <laughs> it's pretty obvious. He went on about a garden, somebody having a garden, somebody having flowers, really liked flowers. And they're like looking at each other going, I don't know what that's all about. And he's like, well, I would think that would be, you know, somebody likes flowers. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys, it was really awful. <laughs> but <clears throat> 400 bucks. So... <laughs> Um, I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. Okay. In the bottom left corner here is Julie, Julie and Jasmine Jones, who are sitting there patiently watching the whole thing. They're the last up. And, uh, Thomas John, uh, starts in with, um, a, that, uh, uh, her brother, Jasmine's brother has left the house. He's nowhere to be found. He doesn't believe in COVID. He's not going to get vaccinated. This is April of last year. And that Jasmine is very stressed out about her brother, who she was very close to, being out there wandering around the streets there in Utah, and that nobody's in contact with him, and she's very worried about it. She also had a, Thomas John talked to her about um, a death of a classmate's father at the beginning of the pandemic and how that weirded her out and how stressed out she is. The other thing, um, and Jasmine didn't know what he was talking about at first, but a little bit later, her mother um, Julie remembered that, oh, one of your classmates' fathers died, right? Okay, yeah, that's right. Oh, I remember now. And he's like, well, that's what I was talking about at the beginning, right? So also, of all the eight readings, this reading was the most religious. It was had a lot of protection surrounding her. Um, I think Archangel Gabriel was supposedly to uh, protecting her, I think. Uh, I know she has a hawk spirit that's... that's uh, that's there too. There's all kinds of different um, protections that some seemed a little Catholicism related, you know, more so than anybody else he had done. So this was just really, really specific. It just was very, very specific. In fact, during the Q&A, and they got a, they got a very short Q&A at the end, um, Jasmine asks Thomas John, she says, to be clear, she, she says, so my brother, who's out there wandering around, who won't get the shot, you know, she's kind of really clear with him. And he says, well, hold on a second. And he, he pauses. Now, a count of like even five is a long time. Okay, now I'm in contact with him. And he's, he is out there living his life. Everything's going to be just fine. So Thomas John zeroed in on this, uh, this young man, her older brother, who's won't get the vaccine and he's protected and everything's going to be okay. 
So it's very factual. Okay. The thing is, is that their name is not Julie Jones and Jasmine Jones. Their names are, are the, they were sent by me. So <laughs> I gambled and they volunteered and said that they would go and do this event too. And <laughs> so we did everything I did with the New Zealand group. I did with them, except I bought their ticket two days before the event. And, I interviewed them. I talked to them about uh, who they would actually be in contact with. This is McKinsey and uh, and uh, Bailey Harris. And um, on McKinsey, the mother's side, you can't see off screen is her husband, Douglas, and he's manning the, the laptop that has all the information on it. So they're there. Um, I don't know if you notice anything in this picture, but um, this is Bailey Harris. I'll show you a second. So she is a science writer. She writes children's books. She's a humanist and an atheist. The whole family is. And um, she has spoken at SciCon, made these very creative puzzles. Her and her little sister, believe it or not, because Bailey's 14, have been writing children's books using from the, and they use, um, um, totally endorsed by um, Richard Dawkins. And um come out with all these puzzles and all sorts of neat things. So check her out. That's Bailey Harris right there. Incredible person who played the part of a 12 year old. I know she's 14, but she played the part beautifully. Another thing you may or may not notice is there is this very Catholic looking saint in the background. And that was put there on purpose. We, somebody suggested, Hey, I know you got an atheist that's going to this event. Why don't you, you know, put a crucifix or something in the background. So so Bailey printed out this at the last minute, put it in a frame, put it on the bookshelf behind her, and nobody mentioned it. But I think this is why her reading was highly religious and even more so in the kind of a Catholic, you know, with, with uh, saints and things like that, um, and not the other readers, not the other sitters. But in her case, it was that. So this is the part of the email I sent to them. Uh, which was my daughter's been having a lot of trouble. And we sent that out to him. Same thing. So as I come to the end of this, I know I'm telling you, I'm summing this up pretty good. So here's what we learned. That's me watching the event. He, I'm looking at it just like you guys are looking at it and hearing everything that's there. I'm his biggest critic. There is no way on this earth he would miss me being there if he was really psychic. And Mark Edward is one of, the no, most notable critics of, of psychics. He's, he's an expert on it, and he's sitting there watching it too. The Girl of Skeptics team is watching this live take place. James Randi, who was a good friend of Mark Edward and myself, is the godfather of the skeptic community pretty much, and he, his organization, the JREF, gave me the money to be able to to buy $800 worth of tickets. That's where we, we get the money from is we were given a grant by the JREF. We also take donations because we're a nonprofit, but that's beside the point. So if you, if James Randi is money is what bought the ticket, you would think the psychic would know that. I mean, that's like the worst juju in the world. Also, these two people are not who they, these two teams are not who they say they are. They're using fictitious names and they have real dead people in their lives. Well, there are people in their lives that if a person was a psychic speaking to the dead, why didn't their dead people come through and say, hey, I don't know what's going on here, but that's not their real name. And I am really their great grandmother or their cousin or whatever that has been looking over them and I'd like to be in contact. But these people are here under false pretenses or just saying, you know, her, her grandmother shouldn't have come through because that person isn't there and <laughs> isn't is it not really dead? And Jasmine's brother is not wandering the streets, not getting a COVID vaccine and, and um, uh, left the house. That, that was non-existent. And Thomas John connected right to him, but that doesn't, there's nobody there. So here's the article I wrote. It's very long and detailed. There's a reason for that. I just wanted to write it once. They have all the details in one place. The audio and the video is not available for privacy reasons. Um, if a media person or a serious um, biographer or whatever wants the information, I have the video and the audio available and a transcript. But um, until that happens, I'm not releasing it public. Um, we don't want to hurt any of the privacy of these children. But this, this article is on my website. 
And if you want to take out your phones to take a picture or a screenshot of my website, everything's here. It's the abouttimeproject.org. And if you want to reach out to me, um, my contact information should be on the website. I prefer Facebook Messenger than email, but you know, whatever's easier to you. So the last little thing I wanted to make sure I mention is that um, Thomas John is starting up again. We just found out that he's going to be doing these readings again with children. He just we just found him talking about it on a Facebook Live that it's okay to have your child attend his future calls that are for adults, but he says it's okay. Uh, the other thing we we realized that Thomas John can't sell out an eight person event unless this the skeptic community buys two of the eight tickets. That was kind of embarrassing for him. He made three thousand two hundred dollars on this event with no overhead. I mean, he has to pay an assistant who kind of checks people in and out and somebody look up some information, I guess, but that's an awful lot of cash that they're making. Um, and the thing he didn't notice is that we were the ones watching and at no point did he ever acknowledge that. I appreciate that you guys asked me to come and speak to you. That was, I'm sorry, I had to condense it as far as I did, but I really had to. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to thank you, Susan. That was delightful. And we do have a few questions. Uh, first of all, it was an observation. A person said, it was a good talk, but I think the picture in the background was Jesus, not a saint. Just for your clarification. <laughs> you might want to follow up on that one. To okay, check accurate. it out. That, that very well could be. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. One of the questions was, you know, um, I read about psychics and haunted houses and Oh, uh, there's supposed to be a ghost at Alcatraz. I read about this in the media, but I very, very rarely see anything that's at all critical. Why do you think some the media, is it just they want a, uh, just a happy story? Why do you think the media is not more critical about this stuff? Well, there's only a small group of people who are skeptics who are writing about these things. It's a very small pool of people who are going to be able to give you good information about it. Um, I think that the media is... Um, I love the media, absolutely adore them, and then I really absolutely can't stand them. It's like a love-hate thing at some point. I just was in the New York Times. Uh, a woman reporter reached out to me, and she gave a tire fluff piece for a psychic that I've never heard of that was somebody who was uh, doing readings to celebrities. And the whole thing was, a, was just nonsense. And she gave me a couple quotes. I was able to, to say, basically, um, you can't communicate with the dead because they're dead. That's about <laughs> all I got to say in the whole article. But it, it made it to the New York Times. I think that I think they think that we're stupid. I think that they think that we uh, need to be pandered to, especially to women. I think the way that when they you, treat women me, when you say we uh who do you mean by we the media that is that is giving these credulous um ghost hunter shows um the credulous articles about fluff pieces on on psychics i think that they don't want to they think we're especially women are just so stupid that we this is what we want i think that in the society we're in right now i think we're pretty sick of being lied to and and the time has come that this is ready but the other problem is is i've been approached by people who want to do a story on what i'm doing or psychics but they don't want to do anything that's a current psychic because they're afraid they're going to get sued or they're afraid that you know i i, I don't know i i really wish we could bust the bubble i think that i think society's ready for some good smackdowns but uh, i think they think that we're not ready for it and they rather show us netflix shows on buying the best prom dress or something you know and and uh, garbage wars or what is it shipping wars or something like this i think we're ready for it but i don't think they think we're ready for it what well, could be and this is my question you think it's just that it's just easier to write a puff piece about a a haunted hotel in Sonoma County. I just made that up, but then it is to actually do the background research. Oh, absolutely! I absolutely think so. It's and it's not. Who wants to? Who wants to read that fact stuff? They want to be entertained, and we need to click. We need to get clicks. Who's going to read the article on? There is no ghost in Sonoma County haunted house. <laughs> read uh, I would read it. <laughs> well, we're a rare breed, there, Patrick. Yes, that's probably true. Uh, I'm looking at another one. Are there any laws at all that 
clamp down on these people because clearly they're doing harm. They're <clears throat> what they're doing is stealing. Mm -hmm. uh, is no. Do you have any comments? There about is that? um. There's a private investigator. His name is Bob Nygar. N Y G G A R D. Um, he has a Wikipedia page. He is a private investigator. You've seen him in the media a bunch. He actually has busted many people who are uh, who have scammed millions of dollars out of people. They've been tried. Um, most of the, he's if you read about him, he tells he talks a lot about how police departments are kind of like, ah, psychics aren't real. What's wrong with you? How stupid are you? You know, why would you why would you fall for that? Just just move away. You know, we want to talk with real fraud. So so there's a lot of problems with um, prosecution not wanting to go there. And that's one problem. And just I know there's some laws in some states like New York City, I think, has an anti um, psychic law. They're, they're just not enforced. They're just and who's going to complain? People are not wanting to come forward because they're embarrassed. They're going to lose their business. Their family is going to ridicule them or be upset at them. So there's many, many times that you just can't find somebody who's willing to come forward and say, I've been defrauded and and I want to persecute. It's it's not. And a lot of the court cases, when they do find them guilty, they just say, hey, give them their money back or um, some of the money back and we'll let you out. They don't even go to jail. Well, that actually your comment sounds like a, a modern updated version of a, a short piece of Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> uh, but you, would you spell the investigator's name again, please? Yeah, his name is Bob Nygar, N-Y-G-A-A-R-D. I think I put two, two G's in there. I think it's N-Y-G-A-A-R-D. Okay. Um, this is a follow up to an earlier question. Uh, when we were talking about the media doing a, a happy little story about a, a haunted hotel or something in Sonoma. Again, I just made that up, but um, but that's not what the questioner wanted. It just he's the question wanted to know is this because people just just like these kind of stories. They're just entertainment. Uh, and they would prefer that to a critical examination. Right. Well, we're storytellers. We're humans. We tell moral, you know, we tell stories through, uh, we, we spread our culture, our uh, morals and taboo subjects and so on through stories. And, you know, a ghost story is just a wonderful way to spread it. There's throughout time, if you read a lot of the books of ghost stories, you can see that it's, that's what it is. It's a tale. And um, so, of so, of course, again, who wants to read the story of, ooh, I went into this spooky house and I got this creepy feeling in the back of my neck and there was nothing there. It was no big deal. It was just the wind blowing across me. Or, you know, I had I had this dream and I thought I saw somebody out of the corner of my eye, but actually it was just a shadow. Or I woke up and I felt like somebody sitting on my chest it was actually because I have sleep apnea. And that's not a fun story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, who's going to read that yeah. either, you know? Uh, I'm, I might read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, thank you, Ms. Gerbic. That was a delightful presentation. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, the people who are watching this, of course, can contact her through her website. Um, I believe that Susan will respond to any reasonable comment or question <laughs> that you of might send to her. Of course. I will. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you all have a really good evening. Uh, so good night. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome.